Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, feel free to spread out. We've got lots of room to work with today. Um, my name is John Ballard, and with me today is my colleague Eamon O'Reilly, and we're going to talk to you about the administration experience for uh, what we're calling the Azure Pack for Windows Server. And uh, as you might have seen me a minute ago, we actually had a different name for this up until a few days ago, so we're kind of making real-time adjustments here. Um, Probably the most exciting thing for me in the next 75 minutes is that we've got 30 minutes of content at least that nobody in, the, in tech ed has yet seen, so that's kind of cool. And the reason I make that, that point is that this stuff has been demoed in little snippets all over the place, and so I kind of wanted to set that context. If you've seen overview, keynote, foundation sessions, you will have seen some of this, and, and I apologize in advance for any repeated content, but we'll try to keep it lively. Um, we're going to go through slides relatively quickly today and try to spend most of our time in demos. I think we've got probably 40 to 50 minutes of just demo time, so um, if I move quickly through slides, it'll be for that reason. All right, let's go ahead and dive right in. All right, um, you've probably heard a lot about this over the course of the last few days. The overall goal of this, of this effort, this Azure Pack for Windows Server, is to create a measure of consistency, and it's about the, the cloud OS, the vision of the cloud OS that we have. Essentially, whether you think of it as one giant cloud with kind of subsections or three distinct clouds, some people talk about it in those terms, essentially three different types of clouds, and we want to have a unified experience across. And the three clouds are obviously the Azure public environment, at the extreme opposite end of the spectrum, the enterprise private environment, and then somewhere in the middle, the service provider, the hosted service provider. And again, the whole point of this is consistency for the developer, the management experience, and portability of workloads and that kind of thing. So um, in the process of working on all of this, it was largely inspired by the idea that we could learn a lot from what Azure does at huge scale in the public space for our environments that are uh, more private service providers have to stand up. And so we, we kind of thought about consistent API and then bringing services that are successfully developed in either environment across to the others. And so that's kind of how you could think about this. Azure's been running now for a few years. We've got a lot of experience with services, platform services like, uh, web, like high scale websites. And so um, part of this story is, is, the, is the single framework that enables us to bring those services across. And so you'll see us talk about that stuff repeatedly throughout the, throughout the week. Okay, um, and I think you've maybe even seen this stack diagram before, so I'll kind of take it pretty quickly. The point here is to try to describe the difference between a public standing of this, of this technology stack and a private version of the same thing. And in the public space, you essentially have the Azure Fabric Controller. Now, at the heart of that is Hyper-V, but we don't distinguish what's in there. We just call it Azure. And then on top of that sit the services and the API layer through which people talk to those services, including the self-service portal that most people know Azure through when they sign up and subscribe to services up there. Now, when we bring that across, the, the underlying foundation is Windows Server. And the whole goal is to, there we go, um, bring that same tenant experience across. Whether a developer is working on uh, a, uh, some sort of DevOps project in Azure, they could get essentially the identical experience in the private environment. Um, the thing that's somewhat hidden in Azure, actually more of a behind the scenes thing in Azure, is the management experience that enables those tenant experiences. But when you bring that across to the private environment, we had to stand up an administrative experience because the service provider, whoever they are, is going to need to essentially do offer creation and user management and some other things we'll talk about in a second. So one of the big pieces of investment that we did here, in addition to bringing a unifor, uh, unified API across, was to stand up that, that set of administrative experiences. At the heart of it all, really, though, is this single API that serves both. If you can program against the API in the public space, you get a symmetrical experience in the private environment, and so your investments translate real smoothly. Um, and, then, and then, obviously, sitting on top of Windows Server is the essentially the system center management head that creates the fabric control experience and then, and then obviously creates the hosting environment for the services we just talked about. And what you could kind of think of here loosely is that as we, as we learn something in either environment, it cross-pollinates. And so, you know, we, like I mentioned a minute ago, we brought websites over from the public space into the private environment. Um, if anybody has seen the tenant uh, deep dive where they go through all of the different kinds of things tenants in this environment can do, you will have seen this thing called a virtual machine role, which, as it turns out, we've stood up in the private environment first and will eventually find its way across to public Azure. So you can kind of think of these things as 
complementing each other in a, in a more ongoing way and, and cross-feeding ideas as they happen. And it isn't necessarily the case that either one has to lead. We just want to make sure that they stay as in, in sync as possible. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a very simple workflow that we think about when we, um, when we describe all the, the experiences that we have here from taking what amounts to bare metal and getting it all the way to self-service tenant experiences. Um, you could envision a service provider having a variety of administration specialties inside their operation, and they basically have people who still do rack servers and, and get the fabric ready. And then there's, um, actually, I could probably go ahead and just play that out. And then there's um, the effort to, to create actual clouds and stand those up. And at that point, there's kind of a role transition. So you could kind of think of fabric administration doing the basics of getting the fabric ready, creating the clouds. And then there's another fabric administrator, or sorry, then there's another administrative role what we call the service administrator typically, and their, their whole purpose for existence is to take those clouds as input and dice them up in the form of offers to the tenants that are then going to come in and subscribe and serve themselves. And in general, what we want to think about is empowering that end user to do as much as possible so that these upstream administrative personas don't spend a lot of time doing stuff that the tenant could do if they only had a way to get to it. Um, and that, therefore, then makes the administrative capabilities kind of more efficient over time. The more you can delegate, the better. And that's kind of a basic workflow. We talk about it a lot in these terms, and you'll see some of this, except that we don't go all the way down into the self-service user experience. This today, this session is entirely about the administrative experience right in the middle where you take clouds and turn it around and give it out to tenants. Okay, so now how did we, how did we enable all this? There were a few things that we had to do to make all this work. Step one was we had to make some changes to VMM, and we did this in multiple parts. But the, and in fact, we had to stand this up in Service Pack 1. Now in R2, we've enhanced it a little bit. We had to make VMM cloud-aware, create the cloud abstraction as a way to encapsulate what a cloud really is, which at its most basic level is a set of capabilities at some capacity level. Um, and the idea here is that there's a provider view and a consumer view on all of these different capabilities, and you can kind of... I'll kind of click through these relatively quickly because I don't need to get into them in much detail, but you get the idea that a cloud provider thinks in terms of the physical resources where the consumer is mostly concerned with their experience of consuming that as, as a service. And so they're not necessarily a mirror image of each other, but they, they, they're sort of two sides of a coin or something like that. And, uh, but again, um, clouds typically are about capabilities and some level of capacity, and therefore typically most often described as an SLA encapsulation of some kind. Now, I have heard people talk about clouds as isolation environments. Um, it, it's certainly the case that you could do that. We, were just, we just got off the expo floor where somebody was saying that they wanted to have a cloud for their HR department and a cloud for finance. And that's, that's, I think it's a natural thing for people to think about and using cl clouds in that way of isolation, but I fundamentally don't know if that's the right answer. On the other hand, we're not about to get... Um, preachy about it. I think what we'll do is we'll just see how this evolves over time. I do know that our architects like to think of it mostly in SLA terms, so that's kind of how you can think about clouds, and you'll see some of that in my demo in a second. The next thing we had to do to VMM was some tweaks to the roles. If you think back to that delegation stack I talked about a minute ago, the administrators have to set it all up. And then at some point, there are going to be tenants that subscribe to that. And we had, in VMM for quite a while, we had a number of administrative roles already defined. Um, and we did already have a self-service user role existing as well. But what we were kind of missing is this idea that somewhere in between the administrators who set it up and the end consumer, there's a tenant administrator who essentially is uh, in charge of making the subscription <clears throat> with a service provider and then turn around and, turning around and delega delegating that to internal users of some kind. And I'll talk a little bit more about how you can do co-administration and stuff in a minute. But basically, we, if you really just boiled it down to a couple of things that we had to do to VMM, it was create the cloud abstraction and get the user roles lined up in such a way that we could then enable that delegation flow that I talked about. The second thing we had to do was the introduction of this thing we call Service Provider Foundation. And this is not new. We were working on this. We started working on this a little over a year ago. It, uh, it first made it out into the public hands in the summer of last year, and it released in January of this year. Service Provider Foundation is the API layer into System Center, and it facilitates a bunch of the experiences I'm going to show you in a minute. You, you could kind of think of it as the API front door into, into System Center, and we we built it inspired on a bunch of feedback that we've got. This is actually not a new slide either, but I like to remind people where we got our beginnings with this API. It was all about 
bringing tenant awareness to this whole thing, bringing a, a way to do um, integration with existing assets, bringing a way to, to sort of build this API into modern applications as, as portal experiences, essentially. And so we had a bunch of different, um, in some cases, conflicting, but good feedback on what we needed to do at the API level for, for SPF, and so we, we set out to build that. SPF itself is a... It's actually a, it's a, just a web service. It's a RESTful OData web service, and it, and it uses PowerShell web services inside of it. And it's a stack of things that provide value on top of the underlying structure. So at the bottom of this picture, you have VMM servers. And VMM servers really are um, nothing more than a scale unit. You know, if you, if you think about what a... We, we always publish, every time we release uh, System Center, we always publish the scale capacity of a VMM server. And I think that the current number that we're quoting is something on the order of 1,000 hosts and 25,000 virtual machines per VMM server. Now, ultimately, that's just an arbitrary scale amount. And, and if you're having a successful service provider operation, you're going you're gonna to continue to go past that, right? So, so at some point, you have to scale this thing. VMMs don't really have a way at least to know about each other directly, and so in many ways you could think of Service Provider Foundation as the federation across multiple VMM servers, and in fact, that's kind of how we think of it in, in a general sense. It provides things like aggregation of query results. If I want to find out which VMs are using a certain kind of SCSI drive, I can in make that query into the system, and I don't have to ask each of the VMM servers. I just have SPF go get that data, bring it back to me in an aggregate form, and I get a view across all my, all my stuff. And at the top of this thing, we have this, again, this RESTful OData access point, and it facilitates a bunch of different kinds of portals. And we, we did this because we have all kinds of different clients and portal investments that exist already, so we needed a lightweight way to wire it in. Um, custom portals are most typically going to be what you'll see at a, at a, service pro, a hosted service provider, and mainly because they will have already put investments into creating sign-up experiences and billing and other things that, that they've already got a portal for. And in this case, what they're going to do is stand up the Microsoft stack and hook in SPF to that existing portal experience. At the extreme other end of the spectrum, we have App Controller. And, and if, any, if any of you have played around with App Controller, it's in many ways kind of the, the rich client or fat client experience for self-service IaaS management of applications. And then somewhere in the middle is this Azure portal, which uh, what you'll see in a minute, I, I sometimes at the highest level describe this administrative portal as something like a, a mix between some features that you see maybe in our service manager product as well as some things that App Controller can do. Um, but, but ultimately, we, we don't necessarily care too much. The whole goal of using um, OData and REST interface in the first place was to enable any kind of, of interactive experience, including if somebody wants to write an app, iPad or an iPhone experience for it, right? So any ultimately any device that can form a URL post can, can request stuff out of SPF and talk to System Center. And then on top of that, regardless of what kind of access point is made available, you have multiple tenants that sign up and they coexist with each other in this environment. And they, they subscribe based on, again, their needs relative to quality of service and they don't really care where the things live. They just kind of um, get placed automatically based on where their offers are created and then fundamentally where they subscribe. So um, I guess how part three is this service management portal and API. And this is, the, this is the great equalizer relative to public Azure. And so this is maybe the, the meat of the story. We, um, we have this framework that, that defines how the portal is built as well as how any resource can pr pr provider can register themselves with the portal. In the case of what we ship out of box, you'll see a bunch of those same services that you'd find in Azure provided in the Azure pack, so websites and SQL and Service Bus and those kinds of things. Um, the whole intent here is that in the long run, third parties also generate resource providers and register themselves with the portal. System Center fundamentally is one of those resource providers, and we fit in by, by essentially allowing this portal and API to talk to that service provider foundation API so there's a rich discussion that happens there and, and the portal can take actions delegated by the admin to the user and the user does things and all of that then just feeds down into SPF and then ultimately down into virtual machine manager. So I'm going to take you in through a demo and show you some of that stuff in a second and it's going to follow a basic flow here. Uh, again, I talked a little bit about how installation and configuration of the fabric is step one and I won't start there. In fact, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and neither will I set up SPF today. But what I'll do is I'll, um, 
I'll go into step four here, and I'll show you how we create offers, and this is kind of that, in that delegation chain. I'm not going to configure the fabric. I'm simply going to take created clouds, and I'm going to use that to expose offers to my tenants and then ultimately manage them, and, and then they operate their own IaaS experiences for themselves. So before I get into the demo, one last thing I want to set up for you is uh, just a quick foundational discussion of who this persona is. I talked about this a little bit already. I'm somewhere between the fabric admin on the far left and the self-service users that I'm trying to satisfy on the far right. And in fact, I, I tend to think of this role as the last touch point before the tenant. I'm probably the, of the, of the administrative people in the service provider operation, I'm the persona that's closest to the tenants most likely. And I have, I have four basic goals that I care about. And I, if you've heard me talk about this stuff this week, you'll, this will sound familiar. I want to attract and retain tenants, and mainly because in their, in their usage lies my revenue, and the more I can get them to use, the better. Um, now, that's not necessarily quite an enterprise statement. We had, a, we had a question come up today where somebody said, hey, what would, I, uh, what would I do if I wanted to every night just delete a bunch of VMs that weren't being used? And I said, well, why would you want to do that if you're making money off them? And he goes, well, I'm, I'm not a public hoster. I'm an enterprise. And I go, okay, that's great. So... As an example, you know, a public hoster might want to leave running VMs indefinitely because they fundamentally don't care if the tenant is wasting money, but the enterprise cares a lot. And so you'll see some variation in how they react to scenarios like that, depending on who the target environment is. The second thing I care about as a service administrator is that I create compelling offers to bring these people in. It, it, it feeds into how I re attract and retain, and I also talked about it uh, a couple of times this week in terms of how my, the balance of the kinds of offers I create are, are something that feed into my, either my profit or my cost profile. And again, you can think of that as a uh, hoster focusing in on profit might think in terms of setting the hook with free offers and then raising steep prices on high value add services, where the enterprise might simply think of, well, this stuff is cheap to stand up, and so I'll let anybody in the enterprise have as much as they want as that. But this stuff costs a lot, so I'm going to monitor it closely, and I'm going to do things like delete it when they're not using it. Um, the third thing that I care about as a service administrator is maintaining capacity and having a sense of usage. And you'll see how experiences inside the portal allow me to have some lightweight dashboards that tell me how my services are doing or how my subscriptions are coming in, how much are each subscription using in each cloud and that kind of thing. And it allows me to know when the capacity is reaching limits. Now, <clears throat> as a service administrator, I don't necessarily have the ability to to add more servers, and, uh, but you'll see a couple of things that the administrator can do, provided they have the cooperation of the fabric administrator people, and, and Eamon will kind of walk you through a scenario on that a little bit later. And then the fourth thing is, is administrative efficiency. I, I typically say something along the lines of, the service administrators want to be wildly outnumbered. They would like to have three or four people serving a thousand clients or more, and, and, the, and in order for that to even be feasible, they can't be answering the phone or doing email all day. They have to have automation to do efficient management of the system. And Eamon's going to go deep on automation. That's pretty much the whole second half of our session today. Um, but, you know, just to, and, and, and he'll talk a little bit more about this as well, but I always like to remind people that it's not necessarily just about efficiency. As you start to bring on enterprise tenants, for example, one of the things that becomes important is, is compliance and policy. And the way, you, the way you drive those things forward in many cases is through repeatable, consistent automation. And so automation has a bunch of value. It can also be the main way you integrate, and I'll, I'll show you some of that in the demo here right now. So with that, let's switch over to my first demo environment. Wait, did I get the wrong one? Try that. Let's see. There we go. I think that's the one. Come on. Sorry, I'm having a... Small technical difficulty here. One, seven, eight. There we go. Got it. Okay. <laughs> this is the uh, this is the service admin portal. And again, just to kind of remind you of this, this is not something that exists anywhere outside the Azure pack. This is specifically for what I sometimes refer to as private Azure, but it's essentially that service provider view. Um, which is a bunch of behind-the-scenes stuff in public Azure, but in this case, explicit functionality for the user. Now, um, what, I, the, what I typically see here is a bunch of resources, that, as I mentioned. Anytime somebody wants to register a new resource, it would show up here, but what you see here by default are the ones that we ship out of box. Um, 
And so now keep in mind the, the frame that I set up a minute ago of managing users, offers, capacity, and efficiency. And I'll kind of use that as a basis for the rest of the tour that we're going to do here today. Um, almost always, the, the number one thing I think about is the users. At least it's my starting point. And I, I have a number of things I can do when I manage users. I can, I can manage their accounts wholesale. I can also go in and manage individual subscriptions within that. Um, the, the, the accounts themselves aren't, aren't ultimately highly interesting, although I, I think this is an enabler of some certain scenarios I like to talk about around, uh, around making your bill current and that kind of thing. You know, if I can, if I can delete an, or at least suspend an account for delinquency, that's kind of a useful thing. Um, and conversely, I also like to think about rewards that I would hand out in this environment. So if somebody is a particularly loyal customer and they're doing a lot of usage, I will periodically come in and, and maybe just give them a subscription for free, something I built out and I'm kind of just doling it out to my favorite or most loyal customers. Um, within the context of any account, there are also the individual subscriptions, and I can drill into those. And I talked a little bit earlier about how project teams can share subscriptions, and therefore um, they can they can do things like have co-administrators. So in addition to this, this dashboard that gives me some basic information about how they're using the, the subscription, in this case not at all right now, I can also go in and, and um, essentially create other co-administrators for this account. And as you can see, this one doesn't have any right now, so I can, I can simply just pick somebody from the... Um, interesting. I'm not going to bother to do that because I don't want to type up a username right now, but you get the idea. I can pick any user that's in my system and add them as an account. So that's the gist of account management or user management. It's not super detailed, and it doesn't need to be. The whole point is that these people should be coming in more or less um, at will. Now, there's, there's, again, there's maybe a difference or a split that occurs between what, when you're talking about an enterprise use of this technology and somebody who's standing up as a hosted service provider. And, and it really boils down to um, I've actually heard people in the last few weeks tell me they think that there ought to be a, an approval workflow associated with signing up and then subscribing. Now, that would be blasphemy in a public for-profit space, but it makes a lot of sense in an enterprise space. So, you, again, you can think of subtle scenario differences between these two depending on where it lands. Now, offer creation is a relatively simple experience. You could think of it as a high level of just taking the different kinds of services that we have available, wrapping them up in, in different combinations and making them available. We have this concept called plan, and I think a lot of you have probably heard of a plan by now, but it's... It's nothing more than a bundle of services, very much like a cell phone plan or any other kind of plan that you buy. In this case, a plan consists of virtual machines, websites, SQL, et cetera. When you create a plan, the actual creation aspect itself isn't particularly difficult. Uh, tech, oops, sorry, typing ed, tech ed demo plan. You name the thing and you pick the kinds of services that go into it. And you can see here that I have essentially the same services that I see in the outer environment. So I can pick any one of these and put them, you know, multiples of these in the same plan. Um, and, then, and then essentially that's it. I'll get back to add-ons in a minute. Um, once I've created the plan, which is a relatively quick thing, the next step I have to do is go, it didn't even create, did it? Hang on one second. I periodically have, uh, this is very pre-release software. The, we still have about a week and a half of bug fixing left before the preview goes out. So we run into a lot of this kind of stuff in the demos right now. Let me see if I can do a plan creation again. Just make this quick. And I'll pick a couple service types. Hopefully this works for me. <clears throat> okay, it's, uh, it's giving me trouble. Not super important. I'll come back to uh, the configuration through another plan that exists already. <clears throat> when you look at what's inside of a plan, in the case of this particular plan, it's got every possible service provider loaded into it. And you can see that they're all essentially clickable because I can go in and configure each of them separately. What I do to configure a website offering in a plan is going to be slightly different than what I do to configure a virtual machine clouds offering inside of the plan. But fundamentally, they're going to, again, boil down to some of the same basic things I talked about earlier, which is capabilities at some level of capacity. Um, one of the things you can do at the plan level is, is get a, a sense of who's subscribing, and that's often useful. If, you're, if you've built a new plan, you would want to know if somebody's interested in that plan. If it, 
If it goes unsubscribed for a long period of time, you probably would want to sweeten the pot somehow or maybe delete it entirely and start over. So uh, you could kind of think of the, the service administrator as being a big consumer of these fairly lightweight but useful dashboards inside this environment. The, the individual configuration experience itself is relatively straightforward. In the, in the case of a virtual machine cloud configuration, you have to decide where the VM clouds are going to anchor. And again, think back to that picture I showed you a minute ago where we had multiple VMM servers holding multiple clouds within each, and it's up to this persona to decide where this plan is going to get placed, at least the virtual machine cloud's part of it. So the first two things you pick are the VMM server and the cloud on that server that you want to have that thing be hosted in. And then the rest of it is all about uh, capacity and content. So what kind of quotas do I have, essentially the capacity of this particular service? <coughs> Excuse me. And then... Um, and then a bunch of other kinds of content, networks and, and templated items and, and that sort of thing. Um, one thing that we're not going to go deeply into today, but that might be one of the most important things here, is this gallery item. And this is what you could think of in a very loose sense. If you're familiar with System Center for any length of time, you could kind of think of this as a little bit of a hybrid between a virtual machine template and a service template, with the difference that we've essentially... If you think about a virtual machine template, one of its shortcomings is that it kind of packs everything about the VM into one model. And in the case of this new VM role, we actually separate things out. So you have the VM container separate from the application logic that might go into it, and that gives you some pretty cool management flexibility. Um, from the perspective of the persona I'm in right now as a service administrator, the gallery is maybe one of the ways that I make my offers very compelling. And by the way, I can consistently and continually bring in new gallery items and distribute those out to existing subscribers. So I could, you could kind of think of it as constantly managing and enhancing what I can expose through the gallery items. So the last thing I, I do want to show you in this environment is this thing called an add-on, which I don't think I've talked about yet this week. It's, a, um, it's almost identical to a plan. Let me see if I can make this work today. Plan add-on. The add-on is really a simple concept. It's, it's, in this case, identical to a plan. So you can see I, I can pick the services just like I would do in the, in the plan authoring experience, and hopefully this will work. Is it going to work? Huh, it worked. Now, what you could use an add-on for... Actually, I should back up just a, just a second. The, the fundamental difference between a plan and an add-on, when they're identical in almost every other way, is, is where it hooks. A, a plan is basically broadly available to anybody, if it's, especially if it's made public and just published, then anybody can subscribe to it. Um, the add-on is different in the sense that it's optional. So I create add-ons, I associate add-ons to plans, and then anybody that's a subscriber to a pl plan that has an associated add-on can optionally take that add-on. So what this really um, presents is another way to do one of two things. You can you could think of add-ons as reward program again. If if I've got a bunch of tenants that are good, loyal customers, one of the ways I can reward them for that is to create add-ons and then make them available either for free or I give them to them behind the scenes. There's a lot of different ways I can get the get the add-on into their hands. The other, maybe the most important thing from a public hosting perspective, certainly, is that an add-on represents an upsell opportunity again. So maybe what I would do is I would create a plan that I can operate cheaply, like hosted websites, and I would literally give it away free. And then through an add-on, I would do really interesting value-add things that I could charge a bunch of money for. And, then, and that way, the, essentially, the tenants are volunteering to give me more money because it's an optional thing. They can sign up for it or not. Okay, so that's, um, that's tenants and that's uh, offers. Now let's talk about how I, how I look at capacity and manage that over time. If you, if you look at any one of these um, resource types in the portal, the administrator gets a view of that resource type in terms of the clouds that back it. So here's a service bus cloud, and you can see that it's ready, and it tells you some things about it. In the case of websites, you kind of see something similar. You'll have a list of any website clouds, and you can go in and configure those. If you click on them, you'll get basic usage data. So this is, this is how you're informed about where to put this stuff. And so, again, when I'm going to create an offer, I want to put it in a place that has capacity to hold more subscribers. Otherwise, I'm going to create a bad experience. <clears throat> and then every, every um, resource type brings its own set of administrative functions associated with this as well. So I can, I can do different configurations on this particular cloud. Um, and again, this list is going to vary, but the, the, the metaphor is very similar. I, I would see some usage information, and then I would have a bunch of administrative options that I can perform against that thing. And it, and it varies from 
resource type to resource type because, you know, fairly obviously they're different. So web, what it takes to configure a website is different than what it could, takes to configure um, some hosted virtual machine fabric. But then think about capacity in a more general sense, too. In this case, I'm a service administrator focusing on making sure that my offers that I create either distribute load well or, or, or avoid, avoid hot spots or whatever it is, but there's also a whole bunch of other stuff that could happen with usage information as well. So backing all of those dashboards that you saw, um, we have a usage data web service endpoint that you can hook a lot of different stuff to. You can hook up Excel to it and do rich analysis. You can do advanced planning and capacity management that way. So we have, in fact, there was an entire session this week on, on chargeback and usage data. Okay, so let's go back to VM clouds now, and I'll take you through the rest of the stuff here before I uh, move on to Eamon's part. Remember I said that, that the consistent metaphor here is that each resource type shows the clouds that support that resource type. So in the case of the VM clouds here, I have, again, the clouds that I'm hosting grouped by the virtual machine manager server that hosts those clouds. <clears throat> and for each cloud, I again have usage information. So I can come in here and I can say, you know, I was going to go create a, an offer on this, on this gold cloud here, but I see that, you know, storage is kind of running low in that environment. So that could be a problem if I was going to have uh, some big data plan or something like that. So I have to constantly be looking at that. You'll also see here kind of a corroboration, at least loosely, of the th comment that I made about how clouds are really just an embodiment of, of service level. Uh, typically, the way you would think of that here is the the gold cloud is going to have bigger capacity and faster capabilities, let's say, than the bronze cloud that has smaller capacity and maybe some of the worst hardware we have. <clears throat> and how you, how you see that dicing up is kind of left to be determined. So I'll quickly take you through the rest of this management experience, and then we'll, we'll talk about efficiency and automation. Um, one of the things that this role can do is support for the tenants. Now, I talked a little bit ago about how you don't necessarily want to be answering the phone and taking live uh, support calls all day long, but, but at a minimum, you could assume that a service provider might well have a ticketing system stood up, and that's actually very common. If it's, a, if it's a hosted service provider, they almost always have an investment in some kind of ticketing system that backs a lot of how they interact with their, with their tenants. And in the enterprise case, you see the same thing. Now, maybe that's an actual workflow or ticketing product, and in many cases, I think Microsoft IT even has um, a number of custom things that we do in the, in the ticket management space. <clears throat> but regardless of how that hooks up, you could imagine me getting a service request of some kind and then having to come in here and look, look for things that might help me find stuff. So I can, I can search on virtual machines. This is a, nothing more than a list of the tenant VMs that have been created. And what you probably see here, too, is, yeah, you see a, we have a couple different kinds of virtual machines. We have these standalone virtual machines, and these were created off of um, what you would think of as traditional VMM uh, templates. And they're nothing more than a, than a classic VM stands alone. Now, in the case of the virtual machine gallery, which is a scalable tiered concept, you'll see a slightly different view on the matter. You'll see, in this case, here's something called HR Web Portal, and it's a, it's a role type, and it has two instances. So you can expand that and see that it has a couple different a couple different instances underneath it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, regardless of what you see here, the whole point is to facilitate uh, the ability to look in and, and you can do things. So I can, I can stop and pause the machine. I can find out basic information about it. Um, again, remember that I'm, I'm a service admin. My, most, my top priority is to give stuff to tenants. I don't necessarily get down in the weeds and debug hard problems in the, in the, in the fabric. So. So even though my ability here is limited to operate on things, you know, I can't really, um, for example, I can't go radically change deep networking configuration, but what I can do is I can facilitate a conversation between um, a tenant that might be having an issue and the fabric admin people. And in fact, in many cases, I might even be able to spot problems with their configuration. The experience over networking is very similar. I can, I can come in and search for a name of a network or the name of a tenant that's having a problem, or I can just search for what's out there. And, and it's, it's very similar. I don't think the configuration details behind any of these particular networks are very rich, but when you drill into them, what you see are the, the different networking configuration items that are listed, a whole bunch of different addressing stuff and site-to-site -site VPNs and NAT configuration and border gateway protocol and all that stuff. It's all here. Now, it's possible, too, that over time doing this, I, as a service administrator, will become more technical about the fabric that I don't necessarily do anything with, but that I just 
make available. And I think one of the ways I see this maybe evolving is that the information here would be enough such that uh, if I would get used to certain problems that recur, I would be able to spot it at this level and simply say to the tenant, well, you need to do whatever, send the ticket back to them, and they can go fix their own problem, and we're off and running. So, um, so more loosely, the way I think of this virtual machines node and these network nodes is, is this is sort of the, my basic facility for providing some measure of support to my tenants. <clears throat> the last thing I'll show you on the topic of, of tenants and offers and, and, and templates and such is this gallery management experience. So just like, um, just like any other template, I have, to, I have to make these things available in the system before I can turn around and then offer them. And so this gallery experience is nothing more than a way to, to pull new gallery items as I find them. Remember, we, we kind of describe these these gallery items as things that come from software vendors and are published. And I can, I can discover them in a variety of ways. Now, this is all fairly early days, um, but I imagine in the future, not too far out, that we'll see an ecosystem develop here. And so there's going to probably be some kind of marketplace or discovery mechanism of some kind that I can't um, totally describe yet, whereby I would be constantly finding gallery items and bringing them into this environment to then turn around and make them available. I can always look at the different gallery items that I do have and do different things with them. You can see I have, right here, I have two different gallery items that are essentially the same thing, but they're two different versions. So that you see here also the ability to version these things over time. You don't necessarily have to force subscribers to move to the current version. They can continue to use the old one as long as you support it in your system. We had a, we had a session earlier today where we did an entire deep dive just on gallery items and that whole experience. So um, I suggest you go back and watch that if you get a chance. The last thing I want to do as a transitionary point into, auto, into the automation is just show you this thing uh, where we, we have general automation available here, and I will uh, defer to Eamon to talk to you about that in just a second. But what you see here is a, is a use of automation in context of the VM Clouds node. And the idea is that I can, <clears throat> if you think about integration or efficiency, the whole goal is for me to be able to stand this stuff up and have it wired up to the rest of what my business already does. And maybe, um, as an example, I have a ticketing system. And so when somebody creates a VM in my enterprise, I want to essentially track that with an IT ticket. So what I might choose to do is catch the event that occurs when somebody creates a VM and use automation to call out to my ticketing system to go and wire up the end-to-end -end process of that, of that service. And it's a relatively lightweight experience here as well. You can pick any object. Uh, let's see, I'll do a virtual machine, create, and I will do something like, let's see, do I have a good example here? Check for cloud memory. Allocate, no, that's, uh, let's see. Yeah, there we go. Add new VM IP to gateway mapping. So in the, in the, Deep in the bowels of the networking that I do, I probably have some kind of load balancer that, that's got a mapping table that, that takes inbound IP addresses and maps them to the gateways that I have into the network. And uh, I don't necessarily want to have to spend a lot of time manually balancing that if it gets overloaded in the mapping. So I can have a runbook that goes out every time a VM gets created to make sure I have a nice smooth distribution across my networking fabric. And I can map that up. And I can also actually dis create these in a disabled state so that I don't have to run them all the time but I can come back and turn them on when they're relevant. I could also think of that as an effectivity date. I leave it turned off until midnight of the first, and I, and I turn on a new policy or something like that. So the whole thing is, again, intended to make the stuff that I do as an admin both more efficient as well as wired up to the, um, to the other experiences. Now, before I turn it over to Eamon, I do want to take a quick detour to go back to talk about capacity and usage for just a second in case you've missed some of the content on that. Um, <clears throat> subscription usage. And I don't have a demo for you on this today, so I'm just going to talk about it at a very high level. Again, we had a whole session on, on chargeback for IaaS usage earlier this week. The basic idea, though, is that as all of this IaaS self-service stuff is happening, a lot of data is getting collected, and you basically have a bunch of different things you might do with that. Certainly, capacity planning and offer management is one, one thing I do, but maybe even more importantly is the generation of, of billing in the case of hosted experiences, or at least internal chargeback for uh, inter-office accounting that occurs inside of an enterprise or something like that. But the, the whole idea is that we make the usage data available, 
And then it would facilitate a variety of scenarios out the back end, depending on what people want to hook up to it and do with that usage information. The capabilities themselves are, again, relatively straightforward and familiar now, at least in terms of everything else we've talked about. It's a RESTful interface that you can attach, and uh, you can even hook an Excel workbook directly to it, or you could siphon off of it and feed it into other things. We have, we have partner offerings that do really cool-looking build presentment off of this, and I've seen a couple of them that will probably do some kind of um, launch announcement later in the year. Uh, and it, you know, it, it, it kind of lights up what you might think of as the Microsoft BI experience. You, you've got what amounts to a bunch of OLAP data, and you can, you can look at it at an aggregate level, dashboard kind of form. Um, you can drill way down into it, and there's a whole bunch of pivot experiences. And the whole idea here is, again, to let you slice and dice the data however you uh, see fit. And with that, I will turn it over to Eamon, who's going to tell us all about the exciting world of automation. Thank you. Awesome. Automation. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks again for coming. So we're going to spend the next uh, 25, 30 minutes talking about automation and how to use that and think about that as you're starting to stand up these private Azure clouds uh, that we're building on top of System Center and uh, Windows Server. So what is automation? You know, in a lot of ways, you have to think about how do you actually deliver these cloud services in a way that they can be consumed and maintained automatically. So in order for people to consume stuff, you really have to do things automatically behind it. Because if they ask for something and then you have to do a bunch of manual tasks to deliver it, then really it's not really cloud. It's kind of like what we do today a lot of. Um, and we're trying to move towards more and more automation as we go forward. But in order to actually get to automation, there's three things you really have to do. First, you have to know what your processes are. So we talk about IT process automation. You have to describe what you actually want when the user asks for something, or how you actually go remediate issues in your environment, how you go debug things, how all of this stuff, what are the processes you as an IT administrator does inside of your environment. Once you know what those processes are, it boils down to basically three things. So the first thing is you have to integrate into your systems. So you may have a lot of Microsoft stack, but you may have other stuff in your environment. So you may have other ticketing systems. You may even have you know, other monitoring systems. And all of those systems have to talk together in order to actually deliver the process. And so the first thing we always talk about is how do you integrate all those systems together so that you can then actually go and orchestrate the process to deliver on that automation. So those are the three key things to think about as we start to talk about automation and what we do going uh, forward. So how many people here are familiar with Orchestrator? Cool, I see uh, about half. Um, so that's good. So Orchestrator is part of our System Center product, and it basically allows you to do IT process automation across your entire data center in order to deliver these on-demand cloud services. Um, but with Orchestrator, we have this graphical authoring experience, which you're probably familiar with. And it has this nice drag and drop capability that everyone really likes and enjoys. But we also have a lot of our users who use PowerShell. And they basically use a lot of PowerShell and PowerShell workflow that came out with Windows 2012. And so with R2, we actually made an investment into Orchestrator to actually bring a lot of the Orchestrator capabilities with PowerShell workflow. And so what this means is we brought in a new feature into Orchestrator called Service Management Automation that actually surfaces inside of that admin portal that we just saw. And the idea behind this is, depending on what you want to do, if you like the visual authoring experience, you can continue to use that. And I'll talk a little bit about the investments we're making there. But if you're a PowerShell user, and you're maybe people inside your organization are very familiar and they like to do the PowerShell authoring, we actually now support that inside of the admin portal and offer a bunch of additional capabilities on top of that. But the one thing to think about is they both now have REST or data services on top of each side. So you can actually go and call each other so if you have a bunch of things done on the orchestrator side or the SMA side, they can interop and call each other back and forth. OK, so here is the new feature. It's called Service Management um, Automation. And it comes down to three things. So the first thing now is the major investment we made. So we have this really nice portal for the administrators to go and actually deliver these plans and users and everything else. And so we didn't want to have another portal that they'd have to go to in order to do their automation as well. And so we actually invested inside of that portal. And there, you can actually create all of your runbooks 
and actually save them inside of our library, and we store them all inside of our SQL Server in the back end. Because it's um, stored on SQL Server, just like an orchestrator today, it runs as a highly available engine. So it runs PowerShell workflow, but it runs it by pulling out all the information out of our database and storing the state back there. And this gives you a lot of things. So any kind of failover or anything else that might happen in your environment, you can actually cluster SQL. You can create what we're calling multiple Rumbook workers, very similar to Rumbook servers we have in Orchestrator, that will just pick up work and actually go and perform those tasks. And then lastly, one of the key benefits of using the PowerShell workflow is that all of those modules you guys are using today, you know, there's tons of uh, PowerShell modules that are out there, a lot of them by Microsoft, but a lot by third parties too. You probably have some of your own environment, or you may have written some of your own. So you can actually import all of those integration modules that tie all your systems together into SMA. And then once we have them inside of our system, we will automatically deploy those out to these Rumbook workers so you don't have to worry about managing those anymore. So it allows you to kind of centralize all of your investments to uh, enable you to do automation. OK. So I'm now going to walk you through a little bit about how you get it, how you set it up, um, and then I'm going to do the demo of how you actually can use it inside the portal. But it really comes down to, you know, get your processes together, and then inside of the portal, you can build up these smaller runbooks, and then eventually tie them all together. So you could just be doing a small process or a completely large enterprise end-to-end -end process. All of those capabilities are inside of SMA um, when you don't have to go into another system. OK, so how do you get it? So if you get the System Center product and you load up the orchestrator um, component with R2, we've added, as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, the service management area. And there's three new um, features you can install as part of orchestrator right now. And so the first is that web service I talked about. So this is the web service that the portal talks to or any other clients that might want to can talk into this web service to actually call and do all the work. The second thing you'll want are these Rumbook workers. So again, to maintain that high availability and spread out the load, you can install one to n amount of Rumbook workers, and they will evenly distribute and take work from SQL to process all of the Rumbook jobs. And then the last thing we have is a PowerShell module. So our cells can be automated through PowerShell, and so you may want to be doing tasks like exporting all your Rumbooks, maybe you know, saving them, backing them up, you may want to be starting jobs through PowerShell. Anything you want to do, we have a full PowerShell module ourselves. That's part of the installation support. And then obviously the last thing is you hook up that admin portal John was just walking through. You just point to this web service that you just set up, and then you're up and running um, from an installation standpoint. OK, now that you have it up and running and you've got the installation going, the next thing you'll want to do is actually start authoring some runbooks. So how you author Rumbooks is inside of the admin portal, you go in and you create these PowerShell workflows. So you may have some already in your environment. You may have written a bunch using the PowerShell ISE. And so all those investments you have, you can actually just import those PowerShell modules or those PowerShell workflows directly into SMA and run them. And so they're actually going to work identically than if you just ran them inside of the PowerShell ISE or by themselves. But the one thing we do with Orchestrator is we offer a lot more capabilities on top of just the core running of the runbook. And these resources we have inside Orchestrator are things like, I want to manage my credentials. So where do I normally store credentials when you're running PowerShell? It's very difficult. And so we will securely store those credentials inside of SMA that then you can then use inside of your workflows. Similarly, you may have variables that you want to use so that you've got a server name that always goes where your build share is, perhaps, or some other place. You can actually have global variables and then reference those inside of your runbooks. And other things you can have, like scheduling. You can actually have um, encrypted variables, connections. All of these things add additional value on top of your core workflows so that then when you have these, you can actually build end-to-end -end enterprise um, processes. Again, once you import and you create all these resources, you then can insert them directly in the runbook by just browsing all of these. So you actually build up a whole library of all these settings as well as all your runbooks so you can actually do repeatable end-to-end -end processes. And similar to Orchestrator, you can actually test them. So you write these smaller runbooks, they do a specific task, and then you go ahead and test, make sure they work, and then you can start stitching them all together. 
and then you can publish them. So one thing we've added into SMA is you can actually work on a draft version while your published one is still working. And so the nice thing about that is you can make sure your updates really work. Once it's good to go, you can publish it, and then all the new jobs will take the published one, and the existing jobs will use the older one. OK, so you've kind of either imported a bunch of PowerShell workflow, or you've created your own inside of the system, but you have your processes running. And so now you actually want to figure out, are they healthy? Are they doing what they thought they were doing? And so we give you a dashboard view that tells you what's happening inside of your system. So you can see over time, are your, which run books are running the most? Are they having failures themselves? Is there issues you have to do? So it allows you from the operator experience to figure out if all the automation you're doing inside your environment is actually working well. And the nice thing about keeping track of all this inside the database is that we'll show you all the job history for all the run books that are going on. And so if something happens maybe yesterday and you started to get some issues, you could drill back into that run book and figure out what happened to it, where did it fail, and go ahead and start to fix that up and get yourself back healthy again. So we give you a complete view of everything that's happened inside of your system. OK, I talked a little bit about the resources, but we have a place for all these automation resources for you to go and create them inside the system. And these can range all the way from just importing modules I talked about earlier. So you could write your own PowerShell modules, or more likely just import a bunch of the ones that are delivered by Microsoft or by vendors you already use for systems in your environment. So you can import and manage them for directly inside of there. Similarly with your credentials, your connections, everything you need to actually deliver end-to-end -end processes, we put these inside these automation resources and then make them available to everybody who's writing runbooks. And so present, maybe you just have a password inside of there, username and password. And so now if the password changes, you can just play, change it in one spot. And then all of the run books that reference that credential will automatically just inherit that and start working again. So it really gives you the ability to actually do enterprise end-to-end -end, um, IT processes. Um, obviously, all that administration we do is through PowerShell inside of SMA. So we have that rich PowerShell module we're shipping um, with SMA, and you can do all of the commands that you can do through the portal through our PowerShell as well. So anything you wanted to do there, you could actually go and script all this. So you could create all these resources um, through PowerShell as well and do anything else you needed to, like import, export, all of those uh, items. OK, so I'm going to spend um, a few minutes now walking through the demo, because I don't think um, too many people have seen it. So uh, hopefully, I'll switch over. I think John brought it up earlier. There it is. OK, so as you can see here, I've clicked on this automation space. And inside of here is where all of the automation tasks in these run books are created and managed. So the first thing you do when you get inside of here is you have the dashboard that gives you a view into everything that's happening inside of your system. And so you can actually go and see how many are running. If you wanted to filter something out, just like you would standard in Azure, you could take out the running, and you'd only see the ones that you're actually interested in. But let me walk you through a scenario just to give you a feel about how you'd actually build up these run books and use it perhaps in the real world. <clears throat> so I'm going to click over to run books. And you can see here, here are all of the run books I have inside my library. So I can import as many run books as I want, and they'll always store inside of here. And I can also tag them. So here, what I'm going to do is just focus on the ones I'm going to show today. <coughs> so what I've done there is I've just basically filtered the list looking for the ones that have this uh, SLA. So I have ones that are called Cloud SLA. And so just imagine a scenario where, you know, John was talking about you've got these clouds that VMM has built up. And what you want to do is make sure that the SLAs on these clouds is actually met, but it's met in an automatic way. And so how would you go about doing that? And so what I'm doing here is I'm actually going to monitor Operations Manager, because Operations Manager inside a system center is monitoring all of the clouds that VMM has, making sure they're healthy. If I see an alert about those clouds in VMM, I want to pick up that alert. And at that point, I actually want to go and do some remediation. And so if that's a memory alert, what I may want to do, because this is a gold cloud, is I want to go and add additional capacity into that so I keep my SLAs automatically happening. So I can go pick up a host and add that host to those clouds inside of VMM so that you can bring up the memory and remove that alert automatically out of Operations Manager. 
And then what I do is I actually go and install the operations manager agent onto that host so it itself is being managed and monitored to make sure it stays healthy. And then the last couple of things I do is once I've added that host in, I actually call into Orchestrator. So I'll call into Orchestrator because Orchestrator has been set up to actually talk to SharePoint. And so I'll actually go and say, Orchestrator, update the item in SharePoint to say that we actually are now have a tracking that we've added a new host into the system. So you can see here we're talking to quite a few systems. We're talking to Operations Manager, talking to VMM. I'm talking back into the Orchestrator side that's talking into SharePoint. All of these systems themselves you know, do a really specific job and do it well. But a lot of our end-to-end -end processes we're trying to get touch all these systems and deliver it in an end-to-end -end way. OK, so let me just uh, <clears throat> step in through a few of these. So you can see here, I have a couple in edit. So I have a few published, and I have two more that are in edit. <clears throat> so I'm going to click into monitor new hosts. And so what this one does is it actually goes and puts a new agent onto a host that I've added into Virtual Machine Manager. I'm going to click on draft. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can see here, I basically have a PowerShell run book. So anybody who's familiar with PowerShell, this um, is pretty straightforward stuff. All I'm doing really is just calling into um, the OM server and then say install the SCOM agent directly on that server. So it's only a few lines of code. But one thing you may have noticed is I've hard coded in my machine here when I was testing it. So I'm going to fix up that because ideally you'd want to pass in the host into this run book so it can be used for all kinds of scenarios. So at this point, I'm just going to comment out this. And I'm going to write a little bit of PowerShell and take that host name as a parameter. So now what's going to happen is this runbook actually takes in a parameter and then it uses it for the rest of the runbook. And the nice thing about doing that is I can actually test this specific runbook out. So here, we dynamically read all the required parameters inside of this runbook and let you fill them in. So you can actually build up your little library of runbooks before you try to stitch together a huge process, because um, it's probably prone to error. You want to test each one individually, and then you can start stitching them together. So here, I could just put in the host name. I know it's working, and it would go off and run. OK, so this one looks good, so I can go ahead and publish it. So now it's published. And I can see inside of here that I've modified it, and it takes the parameter now. So that's one of the items done. So there's one more in edit mode. I'll just quickly get these again. So the last one that I want to work on is remediate cloud by adding additional host. So what this one does, this actually goes and adds a host into VMM automatically. So again, a very specific run book, and then I'll tie them all together at the end. Then we click in, a very similar process. OK, so I've got a bunch of stuff here. One thing to call out is you can see it, I'm taking advantage of these automation resources in here. So I'm not hard coding any of the data in this runbook. I'm actually pulling it from these global settings. And so you can see here, I'm pulling the connection that I've set up using this get automation connection. So I can manage that separately from the runbooks. Similarly, the credentials. So those PowerShell credentials to talk to VMM are stored centrally in the credential store, and I'm just going to pull them in and use them in my runbook. And similarly for a couple more variables. So the cloud, that gold cloud, that's a separate variable again. And similarly, the machining is separate. So all these can be managed as resources and then used inside of the runbooks. If I scroll down a little bit here, you can see it's doing some standard things, connecting to VMM. It's going to add that hot standby Hyper-V host just all standard PowerShell that uh, VMM has in their module. The one interesting thing here for orchestrator users is with PowerShell workflow, they have checkpointing. So now, once you do a permanent task, you can checkpoint that and then continue if it ever suspended at this point. And the last thing here I can do is open ticket. But the one thing I left out is I need to add that um, runbook that I just created into this runbook so it can actually go and add an agent after it's been done. So again, I can click on Insert, and I'm going to click on Runbook. And so you can see here this Monitor New Host that I just published is available here that I can browse all of the runbooks in my environment and just click OK, and it gets inserted automatically for me. 
And the parameters I needed are also inserted for that run book. So all I have to do now is comment out this part here and put in the actual name of the host. So it's up here. It's just called extra host. And that's it. So I've now I've completed the second run book. And I can actually go and do a bit additional work inside of here if I wanted to. You can see I open up a ticket on failure into the ticketing system. And here I call orchestrator to actually go talk to SharePoint. And all of these things I can do by just using the insert. So I can get my variables I have in my system, my connections, credentials, PowerShell credentials. They're all available directly as your author in your run book. And similarly, all the activities are available inside your system. So here you can see I have a bunch that are just imported. And then you can import your own um, as well. So we import a bunch of them automatically for you. But then you would just go and import any others you wanted. And then all of these are available to you that you can actually insert and use directly inside of your own books. OK, so this one I think is looking OK. So I'm going to go ahead and publish it. OK, so what I've done now is I've actually completed the work from a runbook standpoint. It's quite a complex uh, integration piece, but they're all published and tested each one individually they work. And so now they're all tied together, because the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to check Operations Manager, looking for alerts, and then kick off all these other runbooks to go complete the scenario. So I'm going to do that, and then um, I'll, t I'll w talk a little bit about how the jobs work and how everything ties together. So right inside of here, I can just start it. OK, and that's off and running. It's actually quite a long running process because it has to do a lot of things. It's got to talk to all these systems, bring hosts into VMM, make sure the agent is installed. All of that work actually has to go get done. But you can see if I click over, here are all the different systems. So this probably looks familiar to people with um, VMM. So here's my goal plan I'm looking for. And I can see it has one host. And so what I'd really want to do is add another host if I see an alert on side of there. And similarly, if I go into Operations Manager, sorry, you can see I have a bunch of machines that I'm managing that have agents installed on there or reporting back. And so what I want to do is that new host I add in, I'd want that to actually get an Operations Manager agent so I can check the health of that and ensure it stays healthy. But while I'm doing that, I'm just going to quickly, while that's running, I'm going to step into the orchestrator one. Um, because this is going to show you how you could actually call into Orchestrator to do additional work. I'll just edit it so you can see it a little better. So again, this is very simple. It's only a few lines of code. Um, so what I did is actually our PowerShell module for Orchestrator. I just imported that into our system here. And now I can call Orchestrator to do work. So you may have a ton of runbooks built over an Orchestrator. And all I have to do now is just literally talk to um, that orchestrator machine, and I'm just going to call that run book. So the run book is SharePoint slash create list item to track change. And I get the job ID back from orchestrator, and then I can loop on that, make sure it's done correctly. Um, for now, I just print it out um, so we can see it. So that's what's orchestrator. I'm going to um, move over to orchestrator real quick just to show you the SharePoint um, piece. OK, so those familiar with Orchestrator, I know about half of you have seen it. This is the visual designer we have as part of Orchestrator compared to the PowerShell editor you see inside of this uh, portal. But here you have the ability to drag and drop. And I have a very simple run book here that literally just creates that tracking item up on SharePoint. But the one thing I want to call out is that we are actually shipping a brand new um, integration pack, so SharePoint, for R2 with Orchestrator. And it will talk to both on-premise as well as into SharePoint Online. So you can actually go and manage both of those uh, different environments, monitor lists, add list items, do anything you want by leveraging that SharePoint integration pack that's coming out with Orchestrator. OK, that's a pretty straightforward one. Um, let me go try, uh, see if I can track some of the work. So it is running. So I'll uh, click in, see if we're making progress on it. Yep, it's running. So you can see here, all of the jobs I've run on this, you can see I've been doing some testing over the last few days. 
they basically go, and you can track all the work. That, so if someone said, hey, I kicked off a run book. I don't know what happened to it. It said it was going to add a host, but I'm not sure it did. You can actually go back over time, find out what happened, and drill in, make the determination if there's a problem, maybe resume it if it's suspended, or actually go and troubleshoot and edit the run book directly. I'll click in and see. So it's already made some progress. So let me go in to see if it's actually done any of this work. Let's see if it's running or not yet. So I'll try to add one and it failed. So it's got already an installation going on. So what's happening here is my operations manager agent is trying to install it. But you can see it added the virtual machine host directly in. And if I go back into operations manager, you should see it actually be coming under management as well. So if I go into administration, it's probably under pending management, I would say. Or I'm already maybe managed. It's still running, so it may not be complete. And there it is. So it's actually gone over to that new machine and added it back in automatically. So here you can see it talked to all these different systems. Let me just check if it actually talked to SharePoint. Yep, so there's a new one that got created. So I actually called into Orchestrator there, and it actually went ahead and talked into SharePoint and added the item automatically in. So I think you might get the idea here is that you can actually almost do any of your end-to-end -end processes by just building up a set of these smaller run books. And it doesn't really matter if they're an Orchestrator or they're an SMA. You can talk to each other. But it enables you, as that administrator who's responsible for ensuring that all of these services you're offering you need them to actually stay up and respond automatically. If you have to be manually looking through reports and doing all this work, it really isn't going to work. So what we're really offering with this new feature is the capability to think about all of these end-to-end -end processes. A lot of stuff is done automatically. What we're really talking about is things that you have to do in a manual way inside your environment, which generally means talking to different systems because they usually don't talk well to each other. So with Orchestrator and with the SMA feature, you can talk to those very easily, either using integration packs or using the PowerShell modules inside of SMA. So here you can see all the different stuff that I just printed things out so I could track what was going. So you can actually, it's just output from uh, PowerShell. But you could drill in and actually find out what actually happened line by line. So all the streams that get written as these PowerShell uh, run books are, um, execute, you can actually go and see where they're doing. So you can see I can go down here all the way and see eventually it's calling that orchestrator run book. And so you can drill in, find out more information about that. So all of the history is available to you as you keep drilling down more and more. OK, so we only have a few minutes. So I'm going to stop here um, on this dashboard. You can see if there's any suspended. We do bring those up to the dashboard to allow you to actually go directly in here and uh, resolve them. All right. OK, so what does the architecture look like? So if you're familiar with Orchestrator, it's a very similar uh, architecture with SMA. We wanted to bring a lot of the capabilities you have in Orchestrator on top of PowerShell Workflow. So you can bring all this partial workflow, bring it into SMA, and then take advantage of all the additional capabilities. So we basically have everything backed by SQL Server. So that can be clustered if you want for high availability. All of the jobs are in there, all these activities, resources we talked about, all of that gets stored in there. And then these runbook workers actually go and pick up all the work as you submit it through the web service. So that service admin portal is where all that UI work is going on. You could have another UI or just use PowerShell directly. But all, everything will go through our web service into SQL Server, and then these runbook workers will go and just pick up the work. So it's kind of a very standard architecture, but it's been worked really well in Orchestrator, and we want to make sure the similar capabilities were brought on top of PowerShell Workflow. OK, so I have a slide here just on the Orchestrator investments we're doing outside of SMA. We spent a lot of time, as you can imagine, bringing in PowerShell Workflow to Orchestrator. But we're also continuing to do the investments in Orchestrator to make sure it works really well on R2. All of the system center components are being updated, so we want to make sure all those integration packs we have seamlessly work with all the new capabilities that exist inside of system center. 
And then, you know, we did a bunch of SP1 um, integration packs we released in January. And so I mentioned here on the new SharePoint one, we're also going to release as part of R2. So we're continuing to add more and more integration packs into Orchestrator because we know a lot of people like that visual authoring experience. And so we'll continue to do that as we go forward. Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop. We just have a few more minutes. Hopefully, you might have some questions. Uh, we'd love to answer them. John might be able to come back up and depend on what you uh, want to see we can actually go and um, discuss it. So again, thanks a lot, everyone. I appreciate you coming in the afternoon. And uh, we'll take